Welcome, welcome everyone. I hope everybody's having a great summer. Welcome to, I believe it's the 46th um, uh, ZOA Book Club. And we're very excited today to hear from Jamie Glazov of the Glazov Gang, who has the, the wonderful uh, show, The Glazov Gang, and uh, discussing his book, um, which I'll try to hold up, uh, Barack Obama's True Legacy. Um, which is a series of really eye-opening articles, um, and uh, that you know that uh, Jamie put together and edited, and you know a variety of subjects, many of them touching on Israel, um, Iran, and so on, and and you know what Obama did in the Middle East and how he's how he's shaped America and the Middle East. Um, anyway, I will turn this over to uh, Jamie Glazoff right now, and we're so happy to see you here, and happy to see everybody. What an honor to be here. Thank you so much. And uh, the introduction is over. <laughs> we, we have very short introductions. <laughs> I did one. We, we want to hear know. from our speakers. We want to hear from our speakers. <laughs> you know, I could go on and on about your, your, oh, your, you know, no, no. your previous books and all no, the no, no. things you've done. And... <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'm, that's just uh, my <laughs> Rus Russian Canadian sense of humor. And uh, so everybody can hear me okay and I can begin. Yes, absolutely. Well, it's a, and if anything uh, goes wrong, you, you will let me know. Well, it's an honor to be here. And sometimes when you have 20 minutes, you wonder what to say. And um, I'd like to begin by saying that my dad and my mom were dissidents in the Soviet Union. They were very brave, noble people and uh, who I love very much. And they taught me a lot. And um, it's a very long story, but we got out of that evil empire as Ronald Reagan called it. And we ended up in the United States, a country that I love very much and, uh, and cherish, and it's, it's a precious country to me. And we escaped the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union has come to us. And as an immigrant, as I, I was a little kid, but I just want to say that I, just like my parents, just like many people I know from the communist world, we can smell that virus right away. We can detect it. We know who carries that virus. And I'm talking about the utopian virus, the people that want to build the hellhole that tortured my people and killed millions of my people. And we know how they smile. We know how they talk. We know what they do. And uh, we saw it immediately in Barack Obama and it was very frightening. And today is very frightening and very sad for people in my family, for people like me. And of course, for many of us, for all of you and for anybody that loves America. And the catastrophe that we see unfolding before our eyes today does not just come out of thin air. It has its seeds. And, you know, I've dedicated my whole life to studying the left, trying to figure out what they do and how they do it. And of course, it goes way back. Um, in one of my books, In Jihadist Psychopath, I go back to the Garden of Eden, where the left really begins in many ways. But today, I want to say that in terms of the Biden catastrophe, Many of the seeds were planted in the Obama administration. The catastrophe was fertilized in the soil of the Obama administration. And so I wanted to tell that story. So I got 11 experts, 11 brilliant people to write 18 essays on Barack Obama's true legacy. And uh, I'm very very honored and very touched and moved by the blurbs and the advance um, praise that the book received. And Governor Huckabee says that it's a chilling read. And even till this day, when I look it over, it, it's exactly that. It's, it's a very, very scary story. Um, let me just begin by telling a little bit of this story. There's if you get this book and you read it, it's uh, 
I don't know. I remember, I think I was 11 or 12 and somehow I was sitting in a dark room and the exorcist was on somehow. It's one of the scariest movies I've ever watched. Uh, maybe I was a little bit too young. Uh, why I'm saying that is the mood that I was in when I was watching that. Uh, I'm not exaggerating when I say that when you read what these experts write about Barack Obama and what we see happening today in the United States. Some of the ways that I work, I might seem a little bit crazy and maybe I am a bit crazy, but I like sometimes just to take a couple pieces of a puzzle and put it into a puzzle piece and things kind of come together. So maybe just with the 15 minutes that I'm honored to speak to your wonderful audience, I'll just dance around a little bit and give a few images but it all kind of comes together. I'm very interested that a movie could not be made of Barack Obama. That fascinates me. If you would, you know, how a documentary is made, a movie is made, you would think the spiritual journey. What would the spiritual journey be? It's just, it's just a black screen. It's, it's static. There's nothing there. For instance, my dad, my dad went on a spiritual journey in the Soviet Union. He was raised an atheist. And he studied many religions and he can tell you about it. And it was Hinduism and Islam. And he eventually became a Christian. And he'll, he'll very openly and gladly tell you about his journey. Many people can tell you about their journey. Why, why can't, I was always very fascinated by this. Why, why is it so secret? Dr. Daniel Pipes has documented Obama's Muslim youth. It's documented. Dr. Daniel Pipes has done this. Go a little bit into a timeline. We see him at this Jeremiah Trinity Church, whatever it was called. It's supposedly this Christian church. I was always very curious. When was the conversion moment? When, why was this never asked? It, you would think that one would just could ask, when did you convert? And, you know, but this is very, this is very important. And it's very symbolic and reflective and meaningful in terms of the whole story of Barack Obama. It's very meaningful in terms of how he unleashed the Muslim Brotherhood, how he enabled jihad, how much he hated Israel, how much he betrayed Israel, how much he poured money into the hands of those that killed Israelis and Americans. But this question was never asked. And I was always wondering, you know, we have Anderson Cooper and he has Stormy Daniels on and he really needs to know if Trump wore a condom and he's really doing his job as an investigative reporter. You know, this is the media in America. But the investigative reporting, they never got around to just asking our president, when, when was your conversion moment? We're not even saying it's a bad thing that you were a Muslim. We were just wondering about your spiritual journey can't be asked. I just want to put a little footnote at the end of that. In Islamic law, apostasy <laughs> is punishable by death. And it's happening till this day. And if Obama did convert, he is an apostate. Just want to throw that in there into this journey that we're going to take here on Obama, but it's very, very meaningful. 2009, Obama goes to Cairo and gives his Cairo speech. Fascinating, uh, if that's one word you can use. Mubarak, the leader of Egypt at the time, said, I will not attend if you go along with your plans. And Obama's plans were that the front two rows are seeding the Muslim Brotherhood. Obama insisted Mubarak did not attend. We all know about this Cairo speech, but it's a, it's a turning point. And in that speech where Obama brought the Muslim Brotherhood, this is a terrorist organization. These are terrorists. Hamas is an affiliate of the Muslim Brotherhood. When you unleash the Muslim Brotherhood, this is the murder of Americans and it's the murder of Jewish people, not just in Israel, but in throughout the Middle East and all over the world. So this is what Obama did. And the Cairo speech is very, very significant in terms of that. And there needs to be 
two hours to, uh, spoken about the Cairo speech, but perhaps when you'll invite me back. The complete disdain that Obama had for Netanyahu and for Israel and how he betrayed Israel, how he betrayed America as well. But it's very, very much the foundation of this story and of his presidency and of the catastrophe we see today. Just want to give two quick examples of something because we get all the policies. A lot of us know about the policies. A lot of, a lot of us know about the foreign policy and the dynamics, but personal things matter a lot. In 2010 in Washington, Netanyahu and Obama met. They were trying to go over some stuff and they couldn't agree on some stuff. And Obama was getting very upset that Netanyahu wouldn't agree on the issue of settlements. He left Netanyahu waiting for an hour while he went and had dinner with his family. You know, just think about that. This is, this is very, very significant and it's very important when you begin to understand why money was illegally funneled to the mullahs in Iran, why, why when Trump was inaugurated, even hours before the inauguration, John Kerry was just panicking, trying to get those $221 million over to the Palestinian Authority so they could continue pay for slay because they knew that Trump was going to cut it off. This, these are monstrous people we're talking about here. But making Netanyahu wait an hour sitting in a room while he went and had dinner with his family, what, you know, there's an attempt there to humiliate, to demean. Our Shulman fellow, Daniel Greenfield, writes several brilliant essays in our book about Obama's betrayal of Israel, about how he funded the murder of Israelis. And he also shows in his essays, in his work, how Obama created this whole thing of Netanyahu being a racist against Black people. Very brilliant how the left operates. They don't just do it here in America. They did it in Israel against Israel as well. So whenever there was a disagreement with Netanyahu, they had this whole thing that he was a right wing racist against black people. You know, and this is how they operate. This is how the left operates. And it's something we have to keep in mind. I'd like to move on and mention this. In 2008, Obama jumps off a plane. Oh, he just accidentally has this book in his, in his hand. These people calculate everything. Everything is calculated. He has this book. Oh, and it's by Fareed Sakaria, the post-American world. And he has his finger in the book. He doesn't want to lose his place. But that was a sign. It was very much, very much a sign, just like what he said when he was elected, that we're five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. But Zakaria's book is about America's inedible decline. And Obama was basically telling people, this is my blueprint for my presidency, and I'm going to fulfill this as much as I can. We have a, a chapter in there by... Uh, a great scholar, and uh, it's it's on the young Barack Obama, the young communist that I knew, and uh, it we show in that book that the young Barack Obama, when he was discussing communism and Marxism in his youth, all the Marxists would be sitting around around. And our scholar, John Drew, shows that Obama was very clear about one certain thing. It, you know, because there were some sitting around talking about when is this revolution going to happen? And we've got to turn the tables over and grow long beards and scream and smash windows. And Obama was saying, no, 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 no. And it was very clear, even at that time, that Obama was an Alinskyite. Saul Alinsky and the whole strategy. We're not going to grow beards. We're not going to overturn tables. We're not going to shatter store windows. We're going to put on ties and jackets 
and we're going to smile and we're going to speak nicely. And it's very important to keep this in mind because when you hate the middle class, you become the middle class and you join the middle class and then you destroy the middle class from within. And the same with America. So when Obama says it doesn't, I don't care about the red states of America or the blue states of America, I'm interested in the United States of America and all those speeches he made and all of that rhetoric. You know, I studied psychopaths for a long time and I've written this book, She Had a Psychopath, where I show that we're being defeated by psychopathic strategy. And when the devil spoke to Eve in the Garden of Eden, he pretended that he, that he was operating in her interest. This is in your interest. Just have to bite this apple and then you're going to become God and then you're going to live forever. When Barack Obama is on stage as leftists do and says, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who you love. It just come up here. We're all going to hold hands. The left, it's a very, very seductive utopian vision. And only the very wise and courageous can avoid and resist the appeal. It's very important to keep this in mind because he's a deceiver. And I will return to that theme uh, very soon. I'll just touch on a couple more things, but crucial to bring up that's never ever discussed and uh, is never in our media. The disaster in Afghanistan total catastrophe did not happen out of thin air. Just want to go over something here just for a couple minutes. So, so little known. And yet it's the foundation of what happened in Afghanistan and our defeat. And Barack Obama has blood on his hands. In 2009, the Obama administration implemented the counter insurgency strategy. It was called COIN. New rules of engagement for American soldiers in Afghanistan. No nighttime or surprise searches. Villagers have to be warned before searches. Okay. So you're warning basically the enemy before you come. Afghans have to participate in U.S. searches. Hmm, who are these Afghans? Not allowing U.S. Search, uh, soldiers to fire at the enemy unless the enemy fires first or is preparing to fire first. Forbidding U.S. engagement with the enemy if civilians are present. So hmm, what does Al-Qaeda and the Taliban have to do not to be fired on? Oops, just put a couple people right here. U.S. troops could fire at a terrorist if he was placing an IED, but not if he was walking away. There's much, much more to tell on this. The bottom line is that Obama forced Americans to fight under Islamic law in Afghanistan. Muslim lives count. Non-Muslim lives do not count. The overall objective was to increase American deaths, lower Taliban al-Qaeda deaths. And that's what happened. 70% of the casualties of American deaths in Afghanistan happened after these rules were implemented. American boys and girls were writing to their families from Afghanistan saying, we're not worried about al-Qaeda. We're not worried about the Taliban. It's the rules of engagement that are going to get us killed here. And of course, we could go on even just how this violated all of even Sun Tzu's rules on deception. Deception is the key to winning a war. Just want to mention that today because it's this is just crucial. When you think about Barack Obama, just think about a man that sent American boys and girls into a war. And I'm not saying that he started the war. I'm just saying that, you know, it's a revolving door. This is happening. He's the president. Americans are fighting in Afghanistan and he subjects them to these rules of engagement. And this is a crime and he has blood on his hands. Just a couple more quick points that I'll try to go over quickly. Um, the border catastrophe. 
uh, scholar Matthew Vadum writes a brilliant essay in our book that everybody has to read. We have a president today. I mean, we have Chinese nationals being flown in into South and Central America. They're coming up. We have tens of thousands of people coming from the Middle East. They're not even vetted. Who are they? Are they ISIS? Are they Al Qaeda? This is a catastrophe. And you would think that an American president would see a situation where thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of illegals are pouring over the border. You would think that a president who loves his country would say, whoa, 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 get back. Like Trump did. Trump called the leaders of Central America, of South America. He said, hey, if any of these people, any of your people start coming up illegally, I'm not, I'm going to punish you like this. I'm not going to send you aid. I'm going to cut off this. And that's what Trump did. But we know that Biden's doing something very different, which includes taking these illegals, putting them on buses and planes and flying them all over the country. The question remains, why would you do this? He's a leftist. Study the left, and the answer is, is uh, very evident. And to be honest, there's something I just want to share, something that really bothers me and gets on my nerves about a lot of conservatives, like Bill O'Reilly, for so many years. I don't know if you ever watched him. So he said, why is Obama doing this? I really think he really cares about the country. You know what? He was always playing this fair and balanced. Why is Obama doing this? It's very, very frustrating. We have to get past this. Why is Obama doing this? It's not that complicated. Just invite Stephen Coughlin and David Horowitz, if you don't want to invite me and Dinesh D'Souza, and they'll explain to you what a leftist is and why they're doing it within five minutes. You don't have to ask that on your show anymore. We know why they're doing this. And our border catastrophe is rooted in Barack Obama, who did zero to build the wall, undermined immigration law enforcement, punished state and local governments that dared to do something about it, prevented the deportation of illegals. And this, here's one blurred illegals with immigrants. It's very, very important for the left to do this, but Obama did this very successfully. So the dialogue begins, anybody that's against illegals is somehow anti-immigrant. They're brilliant how they do this. I'm an immigrant. I came here the right way. My family came here the right way. Many people come here the right way. This is a completely different thing than illegal immigration. But Obama and the left, they're very clever how they blur the two. And I could go on about that. Obama, the catch and release policy that he really strengthened and it completely overwhelmed this country. He cut down on border inspections, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of people think that Obama and the Democrats do this to get Democratic votes. Partly true. Don't know how successful that will be on some levels anyway. We know that it's successful, but, you know, fingers crossed, a lot of the people that come over, we know are religious people and conservative on social values. So that's another debate. But yeah, that's one of the strategies. But overall, it's to hurt the nation. I want to end my little talk. Um, just with the betrayal of America overall and how it's interlinked with the betrayal of Israel, because the two go very, very much together. And Obama, it was very calculated. So from the very beginning, he pivoted away from being an ally of Israel to being an ally of Islamists. He made sure that all intelligence agencies training manuals were scrubbed from the word jihad. This word jihad was scrubbed out of there. So it, we basically had, a, imagine during the Cold War that you're in the FBI, CIA, you're trying to stop the KGB from coming in, but you're not allowed to discuss communism or even think about communism. Fort Hood, Boston Marathon Massacre, what happened in Orlando? I could go on and on. Robert Spencer documents all of this in our book. These massacres did not have to happen. It's because we have our hands tied 
because Obama and John Brennan and the whole cast there, they basically put a blindfold around the eyes of the intelligence agencies in terms of defending this country. But what happened overseas? Nuclear deal with Iran. Iran is the terror hub in the Middle East and in the world. He didn't stop Iran from pursuing a nuclear weapon. It was all a lie. And I don't know how many people know this. The mullahs were secretly given the right to self-inspections. This is just completely unprecedented. Takes an hour to discuss this. Read Robert Spencer's chapter on it. But this is a crime in and of itself to empower the mullahs to ship money to them, which the Obama administration did. And when you ship money to the mullahs, Hamas gets the money, the Palestinian Authority gets the money, and pay for slay gets the money. So the Obama administration was basically funding pay for slay. The Obama administration has blood on its hands. This is not old news. Thank God for Donald Trump, because this is another whole story, but he overturned all of this. He had a remarkable record on Israel, and part of it, as we know, he stopped funding to the Palestinian Authority, but Biden resumed it. So this is not old news. What Biden is doing today in resuming all of that aid into the hands of those who killed Israelis, this has the seeds planted during the Obama administration. In terms of unleashing the Muslim Brotherhood, in terms of unleashing Islamists, and this goes back to how I started my talk today, it's all very relevant, the rise of ISIS. It's very, very interesting that ISIS is a terror organization. It's a very serious, potent organization, if those are two words to use. You just have to look at what they're doing to the Yazidis and Yazidi girls. And during all that time, Obama made the joke that they're the JV team. He's making a joke about that they're the JV team while Yazidi girls are being held captive and being mutilated and maimed and raped. This is Barack Obama making jokes about a JV team while ISIS is perpetrating the greatest atrocities on the planet. It's very interesting that when Trump gained power, within the blink of an eye, ISIS was decimated. 98% of its territory taken away. The question remains, why wasn't this done during the Obama administration? So, and we know why. And these are a lot of the themes that are covered in my book. Uh, and that these 11 experts write about that's very important to keep in mind in terms of what we see happening today. But we have to keep in mind that Obama betrayed America and Israel. He funded Palestinian terrorism against Israel. He illegally transferred $1.7 billion to the mullahs that went, then went to Hamas and Islamic Jihad and the Palestinian Authority. And the key is that the Obama administration was aware of the consequences of pouring money into Palestinian terrorism in Iran. They knew that this money would be used to kill Jewish people. The Obama administration has blood on its hands and it is the foundation to the catastrophe that we see today because while we were blessed with Donald Trump who overturned a lot of the Obama catastrophe, this is Obama's third administration and Biden is pursuing all of these things and escalating them in terms of everything that I discussed, what Obama did. So uh, that's a, a few pieces of the puzzle and uh, it's a great honor to be here and I, I hope that I made a little bit of sense and got a little bit of the picture across. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, we're going to now turn to our question and answer. And please, if you'd like to answer, ask a question live to Jamie, uh, please uh, raise your hand or let us know in the chat. Um, and uh, or you can just uh, write your your question into the chat, and and we will ask Jamie about it. Um, and I also wanted to mention that we have uh, two you know, our upcoming uh, book clubs. On uh, I guess uh, Jackie, you're gonna, you're, Jackie's going to put them into the chat uh, so that you can sign up now if you'd like, or you know we'll be sending out notices. On um, okay, there they are. Okay, we're going to have um, the Soros Agenda upcoming in two weeks on August 16th, Wednesday, August 16th, um, with uh, Dr. Rachel Ehrenfeld. And then we have uh, Baduistan uh, with Naomi Klein on uh, September 12th. And I hope to also, also see many of you there. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, do we have questions? Do we have questions yet? Um, you know, I, I, I was interested, uh, you know, there's so many you know, fascinating uh, articles in the book, Jamie. And, you know, I'm glad that you brought up, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the attacks on, on Netanyahu, uh. um, because, you know, I, I, the, the Daniel, I guess it's a Daniel Greenfield. Yeah, Shul yeah Shulman fellow yeah. Daniel Greenfield. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, he was a, one of our authors, by the way, we've had him here. Yeah, he's fantastic. Uh, yeah, we've had a number of your authors <laughs> do book clubs here, and we'd love to have more of them too. Uh, but um, one of the things he talks he had talked about was how Obama personalized, um, mm. you know, in, in order to drive a wedge um, you know, to to make Israel a partisan. So he, the, Obama was really responsible for making Israel a partisan issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, by personalizing mm. it and saying, you know, saying, well, Netanyahu is like the Republican. Netanyahu is really just the, the classic pro-Israel uh, position that Democrat, mm. well, you know, the Democrats and Republicans used to have. But, mm. but I mean, I, I know the chapter talks about how Obama drove a partisan wedge into that by personalizing it and attacking, attacking Netanyahu, calling him an extremist. Yeah. And saying, well, either you're with this extremist this, and, and, and kind of saying, oh, well, Netanyahu's like a Republican and saying either you're with, you're with this Republican extremist or you're um, with with me um, and and, you know, kind of precipitated the whole um, partisan divide and then blamed Israel for this partisan divide. Mm. Um, so, I mean, I thought that was a very interesting dynamic, which mm -hmm. you know, the chapter speaks about how this is an mm. Alinsky technique. To personalize things instead of dealing with the issues that Israel mm. is to deal with, such as, you know, the the opposition to the the horrendous Iran deal, which you know, no matter where on the spectrum you are in Israel, I mean, almost all of Israel was opposed to this. Mm. Um, at least seven out of eight uh, people there, you know, according to to the polls. So mm. um, I don't know if you want to comment on yeah. that. Uh, you know, we're waiting for questions from our audience. Liz, uh, you bring up the crucial point that Daniel Greenfield spoke about and, and documented. This is so important. Thank you, Liz, that that he made it a partisan issue. And it was Obama that did that. That never existed before, but they're very clever how they do this, how the left does it, how Obama did it. And he made it that the Democratic Party ultimately became anti-Israel on many levels. And if you were going to be pro-Israel and pro that right-wing racist Netanyahu, you're a Republican. And if you have some sense and you're against this right-wing crazy regime in Israel, you're a Democrat. And of course, that's all in quotes. Um, but yes, yes. And he personalized it and uh, he drove a wedge into the two parties and uh, very, very destructive. And thank you for bringing it up, Liz. And uh, Showman fellow Daniel Greenfield documents how we did that. They're very clever in how they do these things. And uh, when I say clever, of course, uh, evil is in brackets around that word. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, you know, there was some interesting discussion about Libya and the issues there with the, um, you know, the attack on mm. you know, the, and the, the murder of our ambassador mm. there. And, um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about that. 
Absolutely. Well, look, people need to read Claire Lopez's essay in there, but what I would say, and, and of course it's touched upon also by the other authors. And uh, Stephen Coughlin is just incredible. And not just to read our book, but everybody has to read Stephen Coughlin's book, Catastrophic Failure. It's just a must read where all of this is explained. But something very strange was going on there, absolutely, with Benghazi, as we know, because this unleashing of the Muslim Brotherhood and this unleashing of ISIS and of Hamas and all of these forces. You know, Obama didn't try to fight ISIS. He spent all of his time trying to say that ISIS wasn't Islamic. So, but in terms of all of these forces, something very strange was happening in Libya. And uh, you need to read the book, but uh, it appears that Hillary Clinton and John Kerry and the Obama administration, uh, arms were being funneled there and appears that the United States was actually on the Islamist uh, terrorist side, something very, very bad was going on there. And that's why they ultimately had to cover it up and try to cover it up. Very, very dirty dealings. Um, I understand that Barbara Shapiro, that you're raising your hand. You'd like to ask a question, Barbara? Uh, you have to un unmute yourself. Barbara, are you there? So when Biden was chosen, coronated um it was because everybody else tried to uh, present themselves as progressive leftist and people wanted a, a moderate and then the moment he got in all of his appointments were anything but moderate and yeah. and they continue the obama administration so that it's yes. correct yes. to say that this is the third um, Obama administration. My husband yes. feels that Obama has something over mm. Biden, that mm. he knows something about Biden that he will reveal. He didn't support Biden the first time. He mm. chose Hillary Clinton, even though Biden was his vice president. Mm. But do you know anything about uh, Obama's hold on Biden that makes Biden um, follow in, in the footsteps so closely? Well, Barbara, that's the question of our time. And uh, this is definitely the third Obama administration. I don't really have any uh, smoking guns or details here, but definitely they have a hold on this man. Uh, in every way that he behaves, including when he says, oh, I'm going to get in trouble if I do this. It just, this is an embarrassment. We know he's not in control. All I would say right now at this stage is they've, they obviously know a lot about this man, even in terms of everything coming up today. We know that there's a lot there. So we know that they have the goods on this guy and that they're using him. But I would stress that Peter Schweitzer is really the guy who has documented all this because he's documented all of these Chinese dealings with the with the Bidens. And it's just beyond reasonable doubt that uh, that they're the servants, if of anybody, but of China on many, many levels. So Barbara, I don't have any details in terms of Obama, but I think it's very, very clear that he is uh, being controlled as a puppet. And uh, it's very important that you raise that. Thank you. Uh, let's see, we have a question from um, Stephen Parker. Um, Stephen asks, can you discuss the self-hating Jews role in Obama's plans such as uh, Robert Malley? Mm, that's... That's the, another great question. I would, just, I would just come at it from this angle, um, the self-hating Jews interconnected with the left. I studied the left my whole life because when I was a little kid, come to America, love America, all of a sudden there's these people yelling at my parents, telling them that where they're from is a great place and where they are is an awful place. And I start asking, who are these people? And then I found out they were leftists. So I started studying them. And I wrote a book called United in Hate. And I'm getting to what I'm 
to this very important question here because I was always wondering why do Western intellectuals, for instance, love Castro? They would be killed within two minutes if they went to Cuba and said something wrong. And then I was studying, for instance, leftist feminists that were traveling to Gaza to help the Palestinians terrorism against Israel. And then they're being brutalized and raped by the jihadis that they come to help. There's something suicidal here. And so Kenneth Levin has written the book, The Oslo Syndrome. This well, is let me just interrupt you to say that we did a big book club on it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> thank you. But it's crucial. He did it. The Oslo syndrome, how people, how communities under siege behave. Oh, oh, I'm not the bad Jew. The bad Jews are over there. I'm the good one trying to ingratiate yourself with your executioner. And this. And, and, and who was it that gave Gaza to Hamas? It was leftist Jews. It was the Oslo Syndrome Jews. And now why are little children in Israel running to bombing shelters when they hear a siren because Hamas rockets are coming? It's because the leftist Jews handed Gaza over. But yes, and so we have the leftist Jews in power. They surround Obama. They surround Biden. And uh, this is an entire phenomenon. The Bernie Sanderses, the Noam Chomsky that went and met with Nasrallah. Uh, these are the fellow travelers of our time. I spent a long time studying the people who commit virtually commit suicide for the sake of their secular religion, which is the left. But uh, Kenneth Levin definitely... Uh, wrote the brilliant and must read and this is very much part of our journey and our saga what the leftist jews are doing in terms of betraying israel absolutely okay um brian grodman is asking um who do you think will be the democratic candidate in 2024 that's a great question um Liz, what, who do you think it will be? <laughs> oh, gee, I don't know. I mean, as of now, it would, it would be Biden. But, it uh, would be Biden. I, I don't know. This is, it's, this is going to be an on the edge of your seat thriller. Um, I have a feeling that the Democrats, obviously, there's a movement there to throw them under the bus. But will they succeed? And names keep popping up. Newsom, Michelle Obama. Is it just rumors? I don't know. But Biden and Kamala at this stage are a catastrophe. The Democrats have to throw them under the bus. But do they have to throw them under the bus? In the sense that is the fix in again. And even though Trump is maligned and indicted for these things that he did to overturn the election and everything like that, we just know for a fact, Dinesh D'Souza's movie, 2000 Mules, watch it. I mean, even all the videos we see and a lot of the evidence we see, you know, in those swing states, Trump is ahead by two, three, four, 500,000 votes. They stop counting at midnight. And then by 4 a.m., 600,000 votes come in, 500,000, <laughs> are for Biden and 300 are for Trump. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that something wrong happened there. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm worried because we know that Donald Trump filled stadiums and that Biden had three people in a library and I think two of them were mannequins. <laughs> so do we have any hope that Michael Flynn, General Michael Flynn can succeed in guarding the vote? Because he has this movement where they're going to try to guard the vote. Uh, fingers crossed. But I really don't know. It's just um, I guess I'm answering it in that way in the terms of is the fix in because the globalists and the left are such experts at what they're doing in terms of the elections. And uh but anyway, they keep floating these names around 
in terms of Newsom and Michelle Obama. Um, I spend a lot of time almost crying, but I will say that if Kamala gets into power, at least we can get the popcorn and giggle a little bit while we cry in terms of what they're gonna do to the United States. <laughs> okay, w William Post um, has um, not quite, it's, it's not quite a question, but you know, you may have comments on it mm -hmm. and it sort of relates to the question about um, Jews who, um, you know, or kind of the self-hating Jews. Mm. Um, he writes, I am from Chicago and was part of a group of Jewish activists that would counter demonstrate against anti-Zionist Jews in, in mm. Chicago, um, mm. call it Kavod William. And uh, oh, he said, and Obama got much of his money in Chicago by going to wealthy Jews and certain Jewish mm. political families. I guess he's thinking of the Pritzkers and so on. Mm. Uh, he even went to local Jewish pro-Israel events in Chicago to make himself known and to pick the pockets of foolish Jews who fell for him. Mm. Um, do you have any comment, comments about uh, in relation to that? No, it's just it's a great point, and it's uh, it's a phenomenon that I de dedicated my entire life to up till now. Well, not until I was about 13, but I started very early in trying to understand the leftist mindset. And I studied that, you know, my book United at Hate is about the fellow travelers that would, you know, they, the fellow travelers traveled to Stalinist Russia while the massacres were going on and they went there to worship at the altar of Stalin. And a lot of them died. A lot of them were killed. And then in Maoist China and North Vietnam, they're just, they love these totalitarian monstrosities, but they're ultimately devoured by them. And so in terms of leftist Jews, we see it's a very, very complicated phenomenon. But on one level, on the subconscious, there's a fear of being pointed at and being said, oh, you're a Jew. And so, oh, if we create communism and then ethnicity doesn't matter and everybody can hold hands, nobody will point the finger at me anymore. This is part of it. It's part of it. And there, see, leftists, they want to shed themselves of their own unwanted selves. But in the end, it becomes suicidal because they ultimately shed the, even their own life. So when Muhammad Atta on the plane at 9-11 said, just be quiet and you're going to be okay that really didn't end up to be what ended up happening. Things weren't okay. And so for a lot of these leftist Jews, there's some, there's a, there's a, there's a, some kind of suicide happening there, as we know, a self-hatred happening there. But they think that in terms of how they're operating, that they can kind of shed themselves of their own unwanted selves, and then they, they're going to be liked. But it, it just, as we know, it's not going to turn out that way. And uh, but unfortunately, a lot of these people are surrounding uh, Obama and uh, and they're what Kenneth Levin documented is the Oslo syndrome, how people under siege end up having illusions and delusions about the enemy trying to kill them and how they think that just by ingratiating themselves with their executioner, how they might not get killed and everything will be peaceful. And we know that this fails over and over and over again. And whatever, whatever ethnicity it is, wherever you have these self-hating humans that have Oslo syndrome, uh, they cause a lot of death and misery to everybody. I think um, also, you know, part of it may also be just, you know, as, as William Post mentioned, just being mm. people being fooled. Mm -hmm. I think. I think the um you know your book the book gives a couple of examples like mm. that about that such as you know what obama did on jerusalem where i believe it was an apex speech and he he said well your jerusalem should remain united united um mm -hmm. you know at the capital of israel and then mm. um you know so everybody was thrilled about that but then two days later he retracted it and he said oh, well i just meant that there shouldn't be a barbed wall fence between you know uh -huh. and, um you know, and, and yes, and, and this also goes back to what you said about being sensitive. Like you said that because of your experience in Ru in Russia, you're very sensitive when you hear things. You can you can smell it. You can you you you're you're sensitive mm -hmm. to, to to the words people say, and you know it's it's much harder. You know, it's very hard to get anything over on you. Um, and 
you know, I remember seeing yeah. Obama at um, APAC um, in, I guess it must have been the year before he, bef before he, uh, uh, you know, before the election year, I think it was 2007. Um, and he was in a room and talking to people and, you know, and they had all the people, people who were the Democratic candidates coming there and, you know, in different rooms and you can go and hear, hear each of them. And I remember him talking about how the pro the, the big problems were a cycle of violence, uh, and cynicism that you, know, you shouldn't be cynical about, you know, about peace. Uh, now, you know, when you hear that, you know, if you're sensitive, you know, it sounds good if you're uh -huh. not somebody who's kind of plugged in. But if you uh -huh. hear that and you know that it's not a cycle of violence, it's constant Arab attacks on Israel. Yes. You know, this guy has, you know, is trouble. And right away, I, you know, as soon as I heard that, I know that it was trouble. And, and obviously the issue is not that the Israelis are cynical about the prospects of peace. It's because every time they've, they've made a peace offer, it's been rejected. Um, <sighs> So, um, you know, and, and it's been met with terror and intifadas. Uh, uh -huh. So, um, you know, it's re it's realism. Uh, so, you know, I, I think part of it is, yeah, you know, just kind of becoming sensitive as you are from your ex uh -huh. experience of, you know, the, the Russian background or, you know, being well-educated um, about these issues. Um, you know, you have to have a sensitivity to people who try to, to fool the Jewish community. And a lot of people, you know, may not have that and are fooled by a statement and don't listen to the fact that it's retracted or two days later or don't know mm -hmm. really what's being said. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great point, Liz. And most people, they just want everything to be okay. And a lot of people also have an emotional incapacity um, and I have a bit of difficulty with a lot of people on our side, uh, just in general with conservatives, when I try to talk about what's on the horizon, there's a lot of people that try to say, oh, Jamie, you're pessimistic, everything is going to be okay. There's a, and I'm not pessimistic at all. I'm just realistic in terms of making a threat assessment and trying to get ready. But a lot of people have an emotional incapacity for bad news. It, they have to, they, it, they, they have to get through the day and they try to suppress the warnings and the real threats. And this is a real problem. And you're so right, Liz, a lot of there's, you know, there's these two layers on the left in general. We have, because one of the problems I have is people, oh, people saying, oh, Biden, he's so stupid. And oh, the leftists, they're so stupid. Obama is so stupid. You know, I, that really bothers me because these are not stupid people. Like, don't get me wrong. The devil made a stupid decision. I, I mean, I don't mean to impose my faith. There's a lot of different faiths on who the devil is and how things happen in general. But in, in for instance, in the Christian faith, the devil fell and he took the, a third of the angels with him. And yes, that's a stupid decision. But he's also very, very clever in terms of the bad things that he does and how he tries to harm people, right? And so Obama and Biden and all these leftists, yes, they might be dumb and stupid for ultimately choosing the wrong side in general, but don't think for a minute that these are just bumbling idiots. These are very, very conniving, brilliant strategists. So Liz, where your point is very important is that we have the useful idiots on the left who just really are very fooled very easily. They just want everything to be okay. And somebody like Obama just uses, you know, very, very brilliant rhetoric and convinces them very quickly. And then you've got the malicious people that really know what's going on. So there's kind of these, well, there's lots of layers, but there's these two layers of the malicious people who know exactly what's going on. And then you just have the people, like you said, that are being fooled and just want everything to be okay, you know? Okay, I'm gonna ask two questions at once because they're related and I guess we're you know run, running a little bit late in time. Um, Bonnie Freundlich, who, uh, I'm sorry, Bonnie, that I had <laughs> to post it twice um, before we got to it, but I said, uh, what should we do about this awful situation? And Alice, <laughs> and Alice Bretman, who says, many progressives la la label Jews in Israel as white adjacent, adjacent privileged mm. colonialists. 
<laughs> how to deal yeah. with this. And that's a very interesting yeah. question because I know several yeah. of the articles talked about how Obama's worldview mm. is that um, Israel and moderate Arabs are colonialists. <laughs> These are brilliant people, the left. And I mean, just even what they've done with this whole immigration thing, how they flooded Europe with individuals who believe in Sharia, what's happened in our country. And one of the reasons it's happened is that people have been so intimidated and bullied. I mean, look at even what's happening in South Africa. We've got demonstrations there now by the black community, quote unquote, calling for the killing of whites and nobody's talking about it. It's incredible that it's even, it's almost politically incorrect to say that genocide against white people is bad because then you might be a white supremacist. It's just incredible how successful they've been at this, but people are so intimidated and bullied that they're afraid to be called a racist. And because of that, we see what's now happened in Europe and the United States. I mean, there's, you know, I mean, we could go on. I mean, there's, you know, no-go zones now. There's Sharia zones. There's in Europe and many places, women that are not even Muslim are putting on, you know, the burqa and putting on the hijab or they might get molested or raped or attacked. This is happening all over the world. This is a, a very frightening situation, but the left has achieved this through its propaganda. So very important question on that or a point that was made there because the they're, the left are brilliant strategists. They're engaged in propaganda 24 seven. Why David Horowitz wrote the art of political war is he was saying conservatives are not very good at fighting political war. And this is the tragedy. Now, a lot of us are getting better Absolutely. You know, Dan Bongino, Charlie Kirk and Candace Owens and Mort Klein. There's lots of people on the front lines fighting these battles. But in general, many conservatives, you know, they're just having their barbecues and they're just living their lives, which normal people want to do. But leftists are fighting political war 24-7 and devising and creating smear campaigns and slander and libel. And a lot of people are intimidated by that and uh, end up being afraid to speak up. And we live in a world now where absolutely there's a lot of Israelis that are even intimidated to defend Netanyahu or to defend the right policies. And, uh, in general, we're living in a world now, I have to say that even in some communities that I'm in, I can feel people intimidated. And somebody will say, does a woman have a penis? And a very large number of people in the room are afraid to say no. That's how intimidated people are by the leftist propaganda machine. Yeah, um, let's see, Ira Berkowitz um, is asking about um, weaponization of the government against political opponents, and he says mm. that this occurred in you know, the uh, Obama-Biden yes. administration, and he's asking if this also happened in other administrations. That's a great question. I think uh, I'm not the best expert at that. Um, we know of cases, of course, that this has happened before in terms of IRS, how the IRS was used against uh, people, etc. But uh, this is definitely a Bolshevik coup. This is a Bolshevik revolution that's happened in America, but in a much different way. Uh, but this definitely has to be kept in mind, and it's terrifying, because now, as we know, with all the revelations instead of the FBI hunting down Chinese nationals coming over the border, they're writing down license plates of parents at a school board meeting that don't want a drag queen dancing in front of their child in school. So the intelligence agencies are now in the hands of the left. And if you disagree with the left, you are now a domestic terrorist. This is, this is Bolshevism. This is Stalinism. This is Mao Zedong. And it's terrifying what's happening in our country. And um, I guess so. Uh, we'll, I'll ask one more, one more question if you, if you have another minute. Um, JY is asking Is there any time left to turn this around? Good, 
good concluding question. Well, we want, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to leave a meeting saying, nope, we're sinking, <laughs> no hope, you know, and I mean, as Christians and Jews, we, we share a lot, uh, our faiths conflate, and we lean on the Lord, we lean on the higher power, and we know, as many rabbis say as well, the darker it gets, we should be dancing in the streets because we know that the Messiah is close. And so I, I want to stress that here because even during the darkest hour, we know that there's a spiritual war. And if we believe in God, uh, we lean on him and we know that there's a certain timeline of the bad stuff but that God's justice comes in the end and, and we celebrate. We have to keep that in mind. Um, I just will say that on some levels, it appears to be irreversible. It's very, very bad situation. A lot of people do not like me to talk like that or people to talk like that because they just want to hear good news. They just want to hear good news. But I believe that that's very dangerous because by trying to shut somebody up that's talking about the threat assessment and how bad things are, then you disarm people from making the next step of how to defend themselves. It's much better to be honest about how bad a situation really is because then we can make some plans. Um, but in terms of what Biden is doing, if Trump or the Republicans do not get in this time around, and we don't want a lot of these Republicans that are basically just Democrats, we need somebody like Trump or DeSantis or somebody that really wants to protect America, defend America. If the Democrats get in again, and it's Obama's fourth term, it would be very difficult for me to sit here and tell everybody that everything is going to be okay. Um, but there's always hope and things can, their miracles are possible, just like Trump's election in many respects was a miracle and miracles can happen again. And perhaps America will be given a reprieve by the power above and we have to have faith and we have to have hope. But the most important thing is for us to be engaged and so when people say, oh, what can we do? Well, there's a lot you can do. And every person needs to be engaged. And so on the political sphere, having meetings, writing, and if you yourself cannot be engaged and don't have time or don't want to participate by you know, being involved in legal things, you know, I'm stressing that because even when we say now we have to fight for our country, you know, the FBI is going to start looking at us or these domestic terrorists, we're talking obviously about, you know, getting involved in the political theater, getting involved in debate, but most importantly is to support people on the front lines. So people that are fighting the good fight, whether it's the you know, I'm the editor of Front Page Magazine for David Horowitz. Um, you know, it's we are really on the front line. Support the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Support more Klein at the ZOA. Support people who are on the front line fighting the good fight. This is very important. Well, thank you very much for that endorsement. We really do. <laughs> people, we, 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 we very much hope people will support us and support you know, other, other good organizations. Yeah. Um, you know, ZOA definitely. definitely well, I just want to say Mort Klein, I mean, his courage throughout the years and taking a stand when it was the most unpopular and you had the Oslo Syndrome Jews putting him down, criticizing him. But he took the right stance throughout the years, and he really deserves credit for that, and he deserves a standing ovation. Thank you. Of course, sometimes we wish we were wrong. I mean, we wish we were wrong about yeah. as a withdrawal, but you know, they yeah. would have brought peace. But you know, unfortunately, yeah. we've always been right about these things. Yeah. Um, and uh, oh, you know, we've had so many other good questions. I'm really sorry, you know, that we're you know coming to you know actually a yeah. little bit over time. Um, and I have to apologize to anybody whose question we didn't get to, and hopefully we'll get to your question at the next book club, and uh -huh. everybody will join us on 
uh, the book club, the upcoming book clubs on August 16th and September 12th, which are in the chat. And uh, I uh, also, our, our upcoming gala, as uh, we have the date for that already, December 3rd, Sunday, December 3rd. So hope to see a lot of you there too. And, and Jamie, thank you again so much for your time. And most importantly, thank you for putting together this wonderful book, which, you know, is really eye-opening and uh, hope everybody will, will run out and read it. And uh, really, it's, it's, a, it's a great contribution. Well, Liz, it's an honor and a privilege. And I'm also very grateful because we are so marginalized. And uh, it's just, you would think that this book would be paid attention to. But uh, no, I haven't received an invite from The View. No, <laughs> nothing from Rachel Maddow. <laughs> Nothing from Anderson Cooper at CNN. Uh, we are simply pushed into the spheres of invisibility, those of us who are trying to tell the truth about these things. So thank you so much for giving me a voice and to try to bring some attention to a book that I think is just vital for people to know about and to read. Thank you. I'm really grateful. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, everybody, for thank joining you. us today. Thank you. All the best.